Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmitz. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll time. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Hill Varsity Radio, Saturday morning edition. Nice to have you alongside. My name is Mark Cranach, and we have Elijah Herbal in for Chris Schmidt this morning. Elijah, good morning. Good morning to you. It is uh, game day. Oh. Nebraska oh. Purdue. Let's do this. Yeah. Oh, wait. Come on, Mark. <laughs> it would be game day today. Today. It is not. We have seen Central Arkansas play, though, a couple times on TV. Um, I'm still not quite um, dealing with this all that well. How about you? You doing okay? Uh, I'm doing all right. I just want to make a point before we go any further. We also have Damon Barr in this morning producing. Oh, Damon, what's up, man? I wasn't trying to I'm, act I'm, like you weren't there. I'm also sad about um, today and what it means. It's it's not good. I was getting all it's those not, those flashbacks from like a year ago or two years ago this past week of like previous Husker game days, and it was really just taking my mood down. It, it was not an ideal week just seeing those. Like, hey, this was you two years ago having a good time at Memorial Stadium. Don't you wish uh, you were doing that again this year? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. Google Photos and Facebook and whatever. They're going to be popping up two years ago today. One year ago today. And it's all going to involve football. And... um that does not appear like it's happening. Whirlwind of rumors this week, as there has been ever since, what was it, August 11th when the plug was pulled? I believe that's the date. It was the 10th or the 11th. One of the two. Somewhere around there. So this has been a really long three weeks of Sir Yacht of <laughs> rumors. And if you're not familiar, by the way, I have to point this out for people that aren't you know, glued to Twitter all the time. There's this dude named Sir Yacht. That's his name on the on Twitter. It's not his real name. Young cat from God knows where. I believe, <laughs> I believe, I believe he's from Columbus, Ohio, actually. I think he's an Ohio State student. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. I don't <laughs> And that's that's what qualifies him. Apparently he has a source. <laughs> he has a source of some sort, a Big Ten athletic director. But he's just like this random dude. And he <laughs> he he puts all these rumors out there and he has gained an immense social media following because a lot of the stuff that he has said, you know, he's made these ridiculous predictions and try to try to give people updates on what's happening behind the scenes with the big 10 chancellors and presidents and ADs. And he's, he's at least like partially right on some of it. And so in this conspiracy theory world we're in, people are like, Oh yeah, sir. Yacht. We'll follow him. And he was saying that there was going to be a vote. He, he wasn't the only one. Media members were saying that as well. Um, and that October 10th start date was still on the table. That appears to have been shot down, though. Appears. Uh, and it looks like if this thing gets back on track, it seems like the most likely scenario is earliest Thanksgiving. At least that's where we are today. At 7, 10 a.m. on a Saturday, which would be the game day. I, all things considered, Elijah, that's p- kind of how you're seeing it, too, right? Like, it's well, it's a Thanksgiving launch or possibly something in the in and around the new year. Yeah, and after, did you see the uh, the report from the the Division One Football Oversight Committee yesterday? They, they, no, because I've been overloaded with links and clicks and pro- what, what did this one say? So this is from the uh, the Division One Football Oversight Committee, and they haven't voted on these recommendations yet, but they kind of released their first recommendations for uh, the conferences that have uh, delayed their football season. So the Pac-12, the Big Ten, and some of the other smaller conferences as well. And uh, what they said was you're allowed 15 spring practices in the fall in 29 days. So it'd be, it'd be the equivalent to the, the spring practices you lost. Um, from COVID, but that's okay. only if your football season is done or is uh, started in the spring and completed in the spring. Hmm. So if you were to start your season in November from these recommendations, which haven't been voted on yet, but this is what where the NCA may be going, 
is that if you start that season in November and it carries over through the month of December into the new year, that you would not be eligible to have those spring practices in the fall anymore. Which is an interesting, because it seemed like Thanksgiving was the best option. Yeah, it really did. But then the NCAs come in now and they're, they're talking about it. It's not approved yet. It's not fully implemented yet. And it would still just be recommendations from the oversight committee with this stipulation in there. So you could still go with the November practice if, if you're fine with doing 12 hours a week of practices and then ramping up through the month of November. Maybe it's the same as spring practices and the Big Ten says we don't need those. But well, Right. I, I guess when, when you weigh it all, spring practices and the make makeup for that has to rank pretty low on the damn priority list. Right. When, I mean, all things could say, compared to the equivalent of a fall camp and the equivalent of games or a, or the equivalent of a somewhat normal season, like those rank higher than these 15 extra, which everybody got interrupted. And this isn't necessarily going to affect SEC, ACC, uh, big 12 teams, right? Because they are playing now. So they've a sense they've in a sense already forfeited those spring practices. Yeah, and, and that's uh, the kind of difference is if, say, the SEC and the ACC play one, two games here and then their season gets canceled, they have forfeited the right to do spring practices in the fall. So say, right. say the ACC pulls the plug and they say we're moving to spring with the yeah. Big Ten. The Big Ten then would have the option, if everyone else moves to spring two, to then do their spring practices in the fall. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, let's keep teams away from doing any activities uh, if they begin their season in the fall. I think it's more uh, let's give an advantage to the conferences uh, who aren't going to be playing football in the fall, any games at all. They can still have their spring practices, but then if everyone else moves to the spring as well, you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, sort of, right? It's very confusing. My it, brain is like just done with all this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're just t- done with we're it. We're talking about that with Dolman yesterday, how it's just, it's tiring. There's so yeah. there's so many links. There's so many conflicting headlines. There's so much just uncertainty, smoke and mirrors. I don't know who to trust. I don't know nope. which sources are correct. You, you, you get this source, and it's like, I have a source telling me the Big Ten is still talking about October 10th, and you go, well, this is from whatever reporter on Twitter. They have a lot of good good scoops. They're usually right about this. And then you get another report from, I don't know, Nicole Arbach an hour later saying, ah, uh, nah, they're, they're still talking November, December. And I just, I don't know who to believe. I'm tired of it all. I just want to be playing football. And look, I, it's, it's so funny when you talk about all this because inherently you are, if you are, if you are pro football, you are in a sense minimizing the risk of COVID. It's just true. You just are, right? And to some people, COVID is just not even a thing, and this is all a blown out. It's all blown out of proportion, and it's all a conspiracy theory. And after the election, you'll see, right? Like to a, to a good chunk of the population, that's what that's what they believe that this this whole thing is overblown, anyways. Um, I would say the majority of people understand that COVID is a thing. It is something. The the veracity of it who it affects and why um, is gradually just, I think more people are questioning still understanding that it's serious and that it does kill people and that that is not good. <laughs> right. But as we're, as we're sitting here today, we just finished week two of high school football. Have there been some cancellations? Yep. There have been because there's been a few outbreaks and, you know, people go into quarantine because of it, but they don't just pull the season. Right? You just sort of deal with that when it happens, like when you have an outbreak. Um, so, so we've had two weeks of that. We've had actual college football being played. I mean, sort of. It's not like big time college football, but it has been played. And it seems to be going OK. Right. So, so when you. NFL looks like it's starting. Major League's been playing all summer. NBA's been playing in a bubble. NHL's playing. Like, contact competitive sports do not appear to be increasing the incidence of COVID-19. Is it, I mean, is that fair to say? Can, can we just sit and make that declaration right now? 
is the act of playing a competitive sport at the high school, college, professional level, is that act increasing the spread of COVID-19? Is it? I, I don't think Do- we've seen any. Doesn't ha- seem that way. Have we seen any athletes get it through competition so far since all these leagues have been restarting aside from what was it the Marlins and the Cardinals where they had that whole fiasco where they're like, oh, we're going to play one, one guy maybe has COVID. We're waiting for the results. We're going to get the test of everyone else back, but we're going to play this game. Anyway, I think a couple Cardinals caught it, but I think that was it. Right. I, I can't think of any other situations where any athletes got it from competition. Have look. And again, have there been incidents here and there? Yeah, definitely. Um, just like in real life, there's probably going to be an outbreak at your local Walmart at some point. It's probably going to be an outbreak at Target. Like it just it's, it's going to spread. But is 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 are sports increasing the spread? D- doesn't appear that way. And are athletes and those affiliated with the athletes, those in and around programs because of the even if it's not an official bubble because of the basic bubble that they operate in could you make an actual argument they might even be safer than if they're in the general public yeah that argument has legs look at this other thing schools have opened back up all right now i so for folks listen i I live in omaha i live in douglas county we're doing this remote we've been doing this remote for a while so i that's why I didn't know Damon was even there today, because I can't see these guys. Uh, Elijah and Damon are in Lincoln. Um, Douglas County, and specifically West Omaha, where I live, was reported as kind of a hot spot for the virus, for the spread. And it was against that backdrop that Millard Public Schools and others put in place some protocols to, to open school back up. I got a couple kids that go to Millard Public Schools. And... When they opened it back up, it was just like, all right, first week, 25% of kids are going to go to, we're going to have 25% of kids show up on Monday, and then they stay home the rest of the week, and then another 25% Tuesday, and then they stay home, right? So like, so that the kids gradually get introduced to school, so that the administrators and the teachers can kind of like not have this flood of kids just showing up during a pandemic with all new protocols, with masks and how you do recess and how you do lunch and, you know, to, to sort of maintain social distancing and just these new protocols that kids are not used to and teachers are not used to. So that was the first week. And then the next week, everybody just came to school. So week three just got completed. You know how many, how many cases there's been at an elementary school that's full of probably, oh God, I don't know, 100, 500, 600 kids. Guess how many incidents there's been in a school of probably 500 kids and probably, I don't know, 50 to 100 employees. How, how many cases of COVID do you think has happened? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. It's not just a rhetorical question. Um, that's a tough one because the way you're framing the question, I, I'd think it to be zero, but that seems way too low. Because it's, again, as you said, all these kids, I don't know if they can follow the mask mandates. I know there has been a couple of kids in LPS that have tested positive a few. So maybe two? Three. 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 So let's do some quick math. There's been three weeks. What is the average number of cases per week? Oh, I, do you know I, how to do that math? I, I dropped out of calculus. I'm not going to lie to there, you. There would be um, one. Okay. Because okay. there's three incidents and there's three weeks. So a case a week. In, in an environment where there is a building full of children, full of adults, masks are happening for sure. They're going outside. Uh, they're they're kind of isolating with lunch and all that. They, like they, There's not a lot of intermingling, so I get that it's not a one-for-one one comparison to what the football environment would be like. But the point being, protocols are in place. Everybody agrees to it. Everybody adheres to it. And the level of incidence is probably less than you would get (laughs) 
<clears throat> just being like in the community period. Right? Like th that is not a lot. Is it serious? Could that affect does every incident represent the opportunity to spread to others? Definitely 100%. Of course, that's how the thing works. But now after seeing this, after seeing schools pretty much safely reopening, after seeing every sport pretty much having it handled, what the hell is the Big Ten doing? Like seriously, what are they doing? What... what <laughs> What evidence has has been put forward that says that this should not be happening now, that you should not give it a go? Like, seriously, what? Like, what is the have you seen anything Mark, that I, I, tells you, yep, shut it down, totally get it? Mark, I, I kind of want to double down on what you're saying. It's going to sound like I'm not with you for a second because I, I just want to report at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, since classes restarted, what, three weeks ago? There have been a total of 353 positive tests at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which is a lot. But I yeah. just want to compare that to the places where they have protocols in place that are, you know, a little bit better than the University of Nebraska. Because you've got college students, they're living in dorms, you can't mask up at all times when you're in your dorm, you can't mask up when you're, you know, eating food at your, uh, your dining hall. There's, there's places where it can spread. There's sororities, fraternities, all that. And you compare that to where you have protocols in place, like you said, Millard Public Schools, Lincoln Public Schools here in town, and you're not seeing many positive results. So with the college athletes in particular, do you want to pull them out of this structured team environment where they have testing and they have protocols in place? Or do you want to send them out into the to regular college population where we already have 353 positive tests? That, that was the argument Scott Frost was making back at his press conference right before the season was canceled was we have protocols in place with the football team. They're in a safer environment here than they are in the general student population. We're, we're seeing that to be true in the places where there are protocols in place to stop the spread, to keep the sp spread minimal. Low tests, low positive test results. People are doing what they should. Yeah. On, on, on college campuses where you don't have full control over that, kids are still going out partying. They don't have incentive to go not test positive, to go not catch it. They're, they're, right. they're, they're catching it. So you're taking away the incentive in the structure and the protocols from these football players and just throwing them into a general college environment where they're more likely to catch COVID. So I, I, I'm still struggling to see why it's better to, to cancel the season aside from the whole myocarditis argument. And Which that science is all over the place. Yeah, as you've seen in the past, that Penn State doctor where he said 30 to 35% of our athletes – are uh or have myocarditis once they have COVID. And he's like, well, these are also projections and they're not current numbers and it's from a colleague and it was preliminary work and we don't actually know. <laughs> right. right. And you saw multiple other medical officials chiming in saying that is complete crap. There is no way. It is just completely debunking whatever that claim was. And, and even if it was 30 or 35%, do you want to take them out of the environment that can test for heart issues? These, these college athletes, it's not like they're just going to stop working out and exerting themselves completely. Myocarditis is still an issue when they're at their home workouts, right. whenever they're trying to keep themselves in shape for a fall season. You, you've taken away the ability of them to be able to get tested and to see if they're having heart issues from COVID if they do catch COVID. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're taking away a lot. <laughs> you're taking away a lot. And... Look, I, I don't envy Kevin Warren. I, I, I mean, one, he's got a tough act to follow in Jim Delaney, period. I mean, Jim Delaney helped build the Big Ten's brand and the Big Ten's money coffers, you know, as well as any commissioner that's ever walked the face of the earth. I mean, I mean obviously, he's the one that started the whole, I mean, he's a trendsetter for as stodgy and as conservative as the Big Ten is viewed. He's pretty, he's pretty much a trendsetter. Big Ten Network. Uh, conference expansion with how aggressive he was there. Look, he, he, he was something. He was a force to be reckoned with. So that's, it's not an easy job to follow just from that aspect alone, let alone in a pandemic. And it's not easy either. So I don't envy Kevin Warren and having to navigate all of that. But it is inexcusable the lack of of communication and transparency from the Big Ten 
when they have such a huge impact on 14 communities and then some to the tune of millions of dollars un, un, unlike godly uh, impact on people's mental well-being and all that too i mean what what they decide and what they do behind the scenes has such a huge impact all over the damn country it's drawn the freaking president into it <laughs> all right it's drawn the it's drawn his opponent into it. For, by the way, for those people that think that, stop it. Look, but both both sides there are just being opportunistic here, right? Like, let's let's just get away from. There, there's no political conspiracy theory here. Let's just stop with that. Now, the, now that they're weighing in, of course that ups the ante and that makes you wonder. But like, come on, it. It has such a huge impact. And when that happens, when you have that level of power, when you have that 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 much responsibility, you, I mean, you just have to have your stuff together more. You have to communicate better. They are, it is a disaster, an absolute disaster. You have hundreds of athletes and coaches and programs and thousands, millions of fans just in complete limbo, still, three weeks later. Three weeks ago is when they pulled the plug. There is nothing clear. You cannot plan for anything right now. While the rest of the country is. <laughs> right? I mean, when it comes to Kevin Warren, I will say, as time goes on, I am more understanding of his decision to cancel the season because you can see where the the the, the pressure is coming from. It's coming from the, the Council of Presidents and Chancellors. This isn't like Kevin Warren going, "Oh man, like I'm going to cancel the season. I'm I'm going to be smart. I'm going to be better than everyone else. I'm going to cancel the season first. As time goes on, I'm I'm less I'm less prone to that narrative. I think it's more the athletic directors want to play. The coaches want to play. Maybe Kevin Warren himself wants to play. But when 11 of the, the Council of Presidents and Chancellors says, we're not playing this season, I, I get it. Like, he's been put in a tough spot. However, it's not his decision. It, it's not It's not his decision, but no. the way he communicated this the decision, the PR nightmare that followed, that's on Kevin Warren. Mm-hmm. He failed in that. But we can't be mad at Kevin Warren anymore for canceling the season. It's not Kevin Warren took away football. No. No, the, the the presidents and chancellors of Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, uh, Northwestern, Rutgers, all those schools. Those are the people we should be mad at because they're the people that are pressuring Kevin Warren into making this decision. Well, and the ones that are supposedly making the vote. And, you know, that's somewhat frivolous. And, and I got to admit, when, when Mike Flood and the Nebraska players came out with that lawsuit, and we'll get more into this a little bit later on, um, when they came out with the lawsuit in a in Lancaster County Court, essentially demanding internal communications and deliberations, materials that led to the decision, demanding that from the Big Ten, I, I didn't think there was any way, right? I was just sort of like, okay, I, I understand putting public pressure on them, but don't expect anything to actually happen. And then the judge ruled that they actually do have to produce documents by September 12th. Now, keep this in mind. When the Big Ten responded to the players, to attorney Mike Flood, when they responded to his request to the court, they were just like, look, releasing these documents would be extremely damaging to the Big Ten. Something along those lines. Something along those lines. Like it'd be, they're basically saying, hell no, we can't do that because it'll be a complete embarrassment to the league and we got to be able to keep internal processes and documents and deliberations private. Like that's ridiculous. We can't. No. And the court's like, well, you got to. <laughs> so in like, what's today? The fourth, fifth? What's today? Fifth? Today's the so, fifth. So yeah, today's the fifth. So in a week, in within a week, the Big Ten, as ordered in a court of law, has to turn over documents about their internal deliberations and data and, and the reasons behind why they made this decision. According to a court of law, they have to do that. 
Now, could they file for an extension or file for what? Maybe could they hang it up in legal? Could they just outright refuse to do it? And then just and that leads to a whole thing. Look, there's ways they can, I guess, stall, but not really because this is all getting expedited. Usually the, it's part of the discovery. Pro- usually the discovery process is much longer. But given the time sensitive nature of a season of football period of all of this stuff, the court ruled that, yeah, you got to turn that stuff over. So by their own words, turning this stuff over would be embarrassing. By their own words. Well, now they have to. What kind of embarrassing crap are we going to see in a week? I'm trying to, is this something about, I mean, all, all a couple presidents and chancellors came out after the, the vote happened and said there was no vote per se. Like, mm-hmm. And then the Big Ten comes out a couple weeks later and says, well, it was 11 to 3. And it, the, the, the verbiage within their, their statement still makes it, a little confusing whether or not there was a vote. Is that where the the the, the embarrassment comes from, and that there wasn't even an official vote? Is that where we got issues? I, I don't know. But and or the data that they used to even inform the vote. But there is something they're hiding here. <laughs> yeah, like and they got to release that in a week now. And I bring that up not to get into kind of court mumbo jumbo stuff. And ha, gotcha, Big Ten. But imagine that pressure. That is now on the conference, on the chancellors and presidents. If indeed they really don't have much other legal recourse but to turn over the documents. And if they know there's some embarrassing stuff in there. They basically have this week to get their poop in a group and come out with a legitimate plan. And I think if they do that, and it's something that Nebraska, Ohio State, Iowa, some of the ringleaders in terms of a return to play kind of uh, caucus that has developed something that satisfies them. I could see the players and the parents and the attorneys maybe backing off and saying, all right, you don't have to release your stuff, but hey, come out with a damn plan for us to play ball. So this week is big. It's very big because the pressure has been ramped up on the Big Ten more so than just in public discourse now legally. Now legally, and now having to produce documents that could be a huge black eye on their internal operations and what led to this decision. They're going to be meeting all weekend, man. They got to figure this out quick. Uh, we are, we're way over time, aren't we? Yeah, uh, I was just about to ask Damon. Do we, do we have, do we have to go? Yeah, about time to go to the rewind, yeah. We got time? Uh, Bill I mean, Dolman? Uh, Bill Bender. Bill Bender. Bill Bender of the Sporting Dolman. News. I, I apologize. I was... I talked to Bill Dolman yesterday. Get your bills right. Yeah, it's Bill Bender from Friday. You are you are correct. I did I did text you the wrong name. We're going Bill Bender. Got it. Got it. Let's go Bill Bender then. Um, on the rewind, uh, he joined Chris earlier this week, and uh, talking about all this crap that we're talking about now. And then at the after the top of the hour, we'll have uh, Brandon Vogel. We'll have Gary Sharp. And you will uh, talk soon. Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Now back with Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. Back with you, Tail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Some college football thoughts from Bill Bender. Let's say hi to Bill with the sporting news. You find him on Twitter at BillBender92. Bill, never a boring week in the Big Ten. How you doing? <laughs> it's just the latest chapter, and I don't think we're quite done with the drama. It's kind of unfolding like a uh, pretty good TV show, but I think there's more in store this week. I do too, and I really loved your story. Uh, sportingnews.com is, is where you can find it. You know, a path forward for the Big Ten. And, and Bill, you made some arguments this week as far as how the Big Ten could move forward, revisit things to to get in to get back in the game, get back on the field here uh, maybe as soon as October. What are some ideas you had? Well, I think the – first step, and there's some rumors that it might happen this week, is they have to revote and they have to make sure the right safety protocols are in place to play football this season and then once you're done, once you can do that to me, you know, the date October 10th is kind of being speculated about, I'd go a week earlier, I'd go October 3rd give yourself another bye week um, give yourself a chance to catch up 
to the other conferences and, and go out and play. I mean, Nebraska and Ohio State, obviously, Iowa have been very vocal about this because now that the vote is out, we know who wanted to play. We know who's leading that charge to play. I don't know if it's going to happen. You can never speculate that on, on stuff like that, especially in 2020. But the blueprint is there. Bill Bender's with us. Sporting News, Hale Varsity Radio at Bill Bender 92. Bill, if, if things get moved forward, and we'll get into some more detail on that here shortly, you know, how, how is Nebraska going to be remembered by by you, by, by folks in the Big Ten, by college football in 2020, if indeed the Big Ten can reverse course and we're actually kicking off here in Big Ten country? Well, you know, if they can play, it, it, I think, Chris, I guess the question with me is how many games can they play to legitimize it, right? Mm-hmm. I think eight is a good number if they can get there. And here's the thing I've been saying all along, and I kind of fleshed out in the article. I know there's this, this theory that they might try to play starting on Thanksgiving. As fun as that sounds, and I get the reasons why, it's still a non-starter to me because it feels like you'd be playing a consolation season. If they open up on Thanksgiving weekend, they're up against the Iron Bowl in Notre Dame, North Carolina. It's it Just play with – the actual race instead of starting your own race if that makes sense it, it does question i have for you say say things move forward and, and november is decided maybe it's that thanksgiving uh, black friday maybe it's saturday but say you front load ohio state's schedule with uh, a kickoff against michigan with penn state with wisconsin with Iowa, throw in Nebraska. Say you don't have as many games, but say it's kind of a death march test for Ohio State. Could Ohio State still be considered on December 20th, even if they have three or four fewer games compared to a second place SEC or ACC team? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You got to get the number up something comparable though Mm -hmm. i mean i I think it's not going to take us long to realize that ohio state probably is the best team in the big 10 with what they've got coming back but you know you got to play the games i I can sit here and say all along you know ohio state would not lose in the big 10 on paper we've watched them dominate they've got all this talent coming back but all it takes is a night like they had at purdue a couple years ago (laughs) or a night or a day like they had at iowa a couple years ago and that can happen you know i'm sure all these other Big Ten teams are reading that and they're going to want to take their swings at the Buckeyes. I want to get your thoughts here with, uh, you know, a revote. So we're waiting. The athletic directors, they've got to present a plan, right? The return to competition committee has got to have a plan. They've got to throw that out there to the chancellors. They've got to throw that out to the presidents and convince, look, we've got a way to, to deal with covid I think with the rapid testing uh, approval by the FDA, and I think Illinois has been a part of that, you've got a chance to take a test and get a result in 15 minutes. If you get some federal help with testing, uh, not just for football but for other sports, that could be given to you. The myocarditis is big, so you're going to need EKG and machines and equipment to scan and test your student athletes. But maybe that's another federal handoff. So both of those things happen. You test and you get things under control uh, back on your college campuses and specifically within your football bubbles. I mean, is that is that the plan that they've got to sell? Do you think the chancellors and presidents are more receptive now that the vote tally is actually out there that's 11 to 3? kind of ironic in some ways that, that we're seeing all this happen and at the same time what I'm reading is that, that COVID cases are spiking back up Yes. so there, I have some concern with that um, if you're going to forge ahead and they're not ignoring COVID I think they're just going with the information they have and I mean my only concern would be if there's a serious case or two which is totally possible once you drive those numbers up but at the same time, you know, we saw football last weekend. There's been no reported outbreaks with Central Arkansas and Austin P, for example. Um, I watched high school football across Ohio last weekend, and, you know, there were games on ESPN and everything else. So I think the appetite is there. I think 
the Big Ten, while making a decision early, is kind of being influenced by the fact that the SEC, the ACC, and the Big 12 are still going, right? And, and I think that's something. I, when they made that original decision, I'm guessing they thought that the ACC, Big 12, and, and SEC would eventually fall in line. I did, too. And, and I think the thing that kind of threw the, the Big Ten a curveball, I mean, everyone's hedging their bets here. The Big Ten wanted to be first to pull the plug and kind of call the shot of college football. I mean, they've got that that type of ego. And I'm not knocking them. It, it just is what it is. The Big Ten carries a big stick traditionally. And they wanted to be on on the right side of this, but they also wanted to, you know, be the smartest guy in the room. That's how I look at it. Well, you have Notre Dame that really pushed forward and their partnership with the ACC, and then you have North Carolina that's a really prestigious academic institution. You have North Carolina and you have Notre Dame both saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to play ball. We may suspend uh, in-student in learning for a, a period of time, but not indefinitely. I think the Big Ten was counting on those two uh, pillars of, of education, i.e. Notre Dame and Carolina, to, to maybe drive the bus at postponement as well. And that didn't happen. So I think the Big Ten guessed wrong about what was going to happen here. Uh, a thought, uh, Bill Bender is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. As we look at, at the argument to move forward and the vote that went down and uh, the transparency that, that has come forth due to the Nebraska lawsuit, um, do you think do you think emotions can be kept in check? Do you think everybody can work together moving forward? And specifically, talk about the president's phone call with Commissioner Warren. What was your reaction to that? And was that a pretty big domino effect to get where we're at today? Well, uh, you know, the president here. Here's something I've been telling people all week, and I, I you and I have had enough discussions. We don't dwell too much on politics, but here's something you can't ignore. Um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and um, Indiana. That's 74 electoral votes. <laughs> and a lot of those states lean Democrat right now. So just being presented with that info and knowing we know here in Ohio, I tell people this all the time, the last president who didn't win Ohio was John F. Kennedy in 1960. So there definitely is a political bend to this, whether it's Biden or Trump. And I don't get too far into you know that. But knowing that they can grandstand and do those kind of things and point it out, both sides have done that. And number two, if Trump plays a role in getting Big Ten football on the field or he takes credit for it, however you want to look at it, it will be a factor in the election. I don't deciding factor. I don't know about that. But a factor, absolutely. Well, I, I don't disagree with you here. And I mean, it, football's been brought into it. You have Trump's phone call with, with Warren. You have Trump tweeting uh, at the Big Ten. <laughs> you also have the uh, well-timed ad by Biden last Thursday <laughs> with empty stadiums. It's just heart-wrenching. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a 12-round fight between those two, man, and, and college football's, you know, got uh, ringside seats for it. Bill, uh, a thought here as you look at Nick Saban this week. Uh, uh, he led his players in a march and, uh, and protest for, for social injustice. But you're also seeing kind of the other side uh, with, uh, with LSU. They've got a number of high-profile guys, but 16 of their 22 uh, starters from last year's title team, they are they are not playing ball. You've had a lot of guys opt out, and you got, you've had a lot of guys opt out, and there's been some frustration with some of the, the LSU kids about um, of Coach O's support of Trump. Do you, do you think kids have just been listening to agents and said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do me and, and stay healthy and go to the NFL, or do you think – there's more to it, i.e. some political reasonings and frustration with, with the head man at LSU. Well, it could be. But, I mean, this is, I think, as far as politics go, you, there has to be a discourse between mm -hmm. coaches and players if, if it's going to go that way. Um, I think it's less about that and more about the fact that LSU already lost a ton to the NFL draft yep. on the team that was – really good and, and uh, by the way led by one of the most socially conscious quarterbacks in the country and Joe Burrow yeah. and he's proven that at the college and the NFL level um, 
then you lose your coaches, Dave Aranda and Joe Brady, and then now, I mean, Jamar Chase opting out, that's a big loss. So I'm not sure any team defending national champion has lost as much as LSU has, and that's going to make it tough this season on the field. Now, Nick Saban in Alabama, that is a different conversation. I think he is the leading voice in college football. I don't think that. I know he he is the leading voice in college football. What he's done for those players is – is very good, and I think he's keeping those conversations open in a state that historically has been a hotbed for racial issues. Uh, that's putting it mildly, right? So I think Saban is doing the right things to, to advocate for his players, and, and will continue to do that, and I wouldn't expect anything less. A couple more minutes. Bill Bender's with us, Sporting News, talking some college football, Hail Varsity Radio at Bill Bender 92. Bill, uh, I want to get into some NFL here, and uh, I'm usually not one to ask for fantasy football advice, but i got to get your take here with Cleveland, and I, I team up and do fantasy ball with my little, my little guy. My son's my general manager uh, in good times and bad, and uh, we've got Nick Chubb. We've also got Kareem Hunt. And uh, we just kind of took a flyer on Kareem, you know, with the suspension last year. Who do you keep uh, of the two? And you could also make the argument to keep both. But, I mean, Chubb's rushing yards and carries were great. Hunt, though, isn't far removed from winning the, the league rushing title. You're kind of up there in, in, in uh, you know, AFC Central territory. What do you think of the running back room for Cleveland? Uh, you got to have them both. I think Nick Chubb, obviously, he could lead the late AFC in rushing again, or, or be right in that discussion. Right, be, be, He finished behind Derrick Henry last year, but he'll be in that mix. And then Green Hunt, a super talented back. That is a heck of a tandem. And you're seeing that, and you've seen that in the NFL for yep. years, where you want to have the handcuff, whatever you want to call it, but the handcuff anymore, they, they split up the carries pretty evenly. I think, uh, you know, it's a little bit different than down in Cincy, where they have a super talented running back in Joe Mixon. But they don't have a guy behind him. And then you start to wonder how that will work out. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good thing. I mean, obviously, it's sporting news with a little less college football over the next few weeks. I'm, I'm helping out with the fan- I actually started at sporting news on the fantasy desk. So, awesome. kind of like riding a bike. Um, <laughs> but if you need, if you actually need advice, go to Matt Lutowski on there. He, he is, he and I have been working together for 12 years and, Nobody does fantasy football better than Matt Latowski. I'd love Don't that. Don't tell him I said that, though. Well, you know, we'll, we'll maybe send him the audio clip and, and get a smile yeah. out of him. How are you feeling about Cincinnati? I mean, what, what do you think uh, a second year is going to be like with Zach Taylor and specifically Joe Burrow? What's a fair expectation? They got an awesome skill position talent. I, yeah. mean, I mentioned Mix and, and then the receivers with A.J. Green coming back, Tyler Boyd, Auden Tate. You know, that's, that's a pretty good – three targets there, and then rookie T. Higgins working into the mix. I mean, Burrow's going to have guys to throw to. They're very high on him in Ohio right now. Bengals fans are super excited, and with good reason. And I think Joe Burrow could have a season very comparable to what Baker Mayfield did as a rookie. Um, There may be some picks, and there are going to be growing pains. There always are with rookies. But I think his yards and touchdowns could please fantasy owners. I I think so, too. And and expecting a a bounce back year from Baker. I mean, I'm not saying that they'll just ask him to manage. They'll still want him to make some plays and make some throws. But he's got a lot of weapons too, doesn't he? And, and you got Bill Callahan up there uh, as part of the offensive line, uh, you know, brain trust. Yeah, they made investments in the right spots. They got Austin Hooper. They got Jack Coughlin at tackle. They drafted another tackle. I mean, they still have OBJ and Landry and those two running backs you mentioned. So it's kind of a no excuses year. You know, last year. They were out there as the offseason darling. They were kind of a like a WWF heel in some ways. Like <laughs> they didn't really know how to handle the hype. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm watching this year. Did they learn from those lessons? Will they be able to handle the hype? In a division where you have three guys that won the Heisman Trophy in Lamar, Burrow and Mayfield, and then the other guys back and Big Ben's won a couple Super Bowls. So I think the AFC North one of the more interesting divisions in football. It, it will be. Um, last thought here on football before we talk Netflix. Uh, I need a, huh. a, a, a thought here. This I saw this uh, with a, a Twitter handle for Nebraska, and it was it was really cool. They wanted a GIF or a picture of the Husker running back you'd have to, you you would give the football to at the one yard line. 
it, it being, you know, Trump says the ball's at the one and we're trying to decide is he, you know, is it first and goal or first and 99 <laughs> with yeah. the with the Big Ten here coming back. But uh, I'm a Tom Rathman guy. So I, I, I said, you know what, give me give me the old fullback from Grand Island. And uh, Tom Rathman was my pick from an NFL standpoint, past or present. What's the one back that you say he's getting me the ball, he's going to get the ball, and, and he'll get me the touchdown 10 times out of 10? What back would you pick I'll, from the one? I'll give you two answers. I'll give you the, the Nebraska answer. The first name that popped up was Schlesinger. Okay. Um, just remembering him as a fullback. Even, you know, Rathman, Schlesinger, McAvicka, whoever. But I just remember Schlesinger being really tough. And he's awesome. runner for them. And that's all I got to go, Emmett, though. Okay. I mean, Emmett's going to get go behind Moose, and he's going to get me in the zone, and he's going to beat my Packers, and that's just the way my childhood was. So <laughs> maybe I'm a little cursed there, but I think you got to give the ball to Emmett. Man, there were some really fun play. I mean, they didn't turn out fun for you, but, I mean, there were some really fun – Years, the back and forth with Dallas and Green Bay, and finally, you know, you guys got over and got Dallas and Irvin and Emmett and Aikman up at Lambeau and put the smackdown on them in the postseason. After instead of having to go down there, uh, you know, in some of those '90s teams, so you uh, you had the last laugh. I'm going to go uh, Earl Campbell. Uh, I love watching yeah, the NFL films. Uh, uh, Earl, just how you. I still have nightmares about Texas Stadium. The old ones. I, I, I can't do it. I can't talk about it. I mean, I'm just they ruined my childhood. They were great teams, though, and, and they really were. And I remember those years. It was a lot of fun. Well, Nebraskans still have nightmares of Texas, so we're, we're on the same page. Uh, quick thought here on Cobra Kai. I'm, I'm, I'm sifting through Fargo. So I started that, and I'm on season two of there, and I don't know how I feel about season two. Season one was great with Billy Bob Thornton. So that's what I'm checking out. But you're big on Cobra Kai. Original Karate Kid was money, but but is this something I need to look at? You do. Uh, anybody that is a true fan of Karate Kid will appreciate the two things this show has done and why it's resurfaced on Netflix and it's taken off. One, it offers a lot of fan service for the originals and sometimes reboots don't do that but it does it in a way that you don't rule your eyes too much okay. you're pretty much into it and two uh, William Zopka is Johnny Lawrence is absolutely incredible it, it, it bridges it's a rare show that bridges Gen X Y and Z okay and that's really hard to find and, and I think this show is pulling that off in spades and I think that's why a lot of people are streaming it on Netflix it looks for that to continue my buddies have been texting me about it all week it's pretty incredible I'll have to check that out and it's the most hated due to the 80s was, was Johnny from Cobra Kai uh, arguably Bill Bender awesome stuff with the sporting news at Bill Bender 92 on Twitter Bill it was fun man thanks for a few minutes hey no problem thanks for having me on the Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmitz. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Hail Varsity Radio, Saturday morning edition. Mark Cranach with Elijah Herbal sitting in for Chris Schmidt, who we hope for a triumphant return next week. Not because we don't like Elijah, but because Chris is, you know, the kind of host of the show. Um, that's the main reason why. Hey, Elijah, I spread fake news. In what in way? Last segment. Well, I said, I said that the Big Ten has to turn over all of their deliberations and documents, which they do not in court they do not have to turn over all of them what they do have to turn in is their vote like the and they and they voluntarily said the vote was 11 to 3 right they've already said that but that contradicts what a couple presidents have said on record by saying i wouldn't say it was a vote it was more of, more of a deliberative process you have two different presidents that have said that. I believe Michigan State and Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. Just saying that there wasn't a vote. And the Big Ten said, yeah, there was a vote. It was 11 to 3. Now, in it, so in addition to having to turn over those details, which they've already volunteered, saying that there was an 11 to 3 vote, they also have to turn over their bylaws, which 
they did submit bylaws, but they redacted 11 of 13 pages of those bylaws. And the reason why that might be important is because if in the bylaws it states that you must have a vote, you must have a vote to make a decision and you must have, you know, 60 percent of the vote or whatever to ratify any kind of legislation that you're considering. If they did not have a vote, then they violated their own bylaws. And then the Nebraska players would have a case in that uh, sense. More of one. At least that's how I'm reading it. Um, Brandon Vogel is a very red man. Managing director for Hale Varsity joins us now. Brandon, is that how you are reading it as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> obviously, not a not a legal expert by by any means, but it, you know, it's just it's <laughs> it, it, it feels reminiscent of you know two months ago when we were talking about are they going to play? Are they not going to play? And I seem to go back and forth each and every day on on, on how I felt. Um, it, it's getting to that point a little bit with this lawsuit in that you know, okay, it's, it's cited in there in the Nebraska player's suit uh, about just the confusion around the vote. You know, Ronnie Green is one of the people who's come out and said directly, oh, yes, there was a vote. But you almost think that uh, the people advising uh, Mike Flood and, and the Nebraska players have to have a sense that, okay, something's off here. Because, if it, you know, the president or the chancellor of your own university is saying, hey, guys, yeah, there was, there was a vote. Um, it, it makes the whole thing look a little bit, uh, a little bit overly ambitious. But that's not the case, and a judge has kind of granted them a couple of small wins here along the way. So, um, I, I guess we'll find out at some point what exactly happened here. But right now, I still don't know for sure. Brendan, we were talking in the first hour. It kind of feels like the Big Ten has something to hide here. Are you getting that feel as well? Um, possibly. Uh, you know it. With the filing that they made this week, um, and as, as you guys were talking about with, with the parts that were redacted, it, it, it makes me feel that way a little bit more. You know, initially, um, initially when they came out and said, oh, you know, we can't do this. This is just an unreasonable expectation. It's, you open this door. I mean, it's, it's all the kind of like standard legal stuff that you would do. Um, you're not going to turn over things unless you're, unless you're forced to. And, and so far they've been – forced to um so either you know i know there's there's some legal ex- experts out there just in the past couple of days who have been talking about uh what, what happened here why are they why are they being so uh, opaque with something that should be pretty straightforward so they came out and gave the results of the vote um but if i guess what they can't prove like i just i don't know what the protocol is there like okay it was 11 to 3 supposedly like what evidence what documents are there that that note that i mean are we looking for you know a uh, a hand a, a tally by hand from Morton Shapiro on northwestern letterhead i i don't know uh, you know and i'm not making light of it it's just it's strange and when you can't do these things in person um it, it makes it even a little bit it's just such a odd marker of our current time right now and we'll see where it goes there was a report yesterday in sports illustrated brandon about um mark schlissel who is the president of the university of michigan incidentally an immunologist too uh as being sort of the ringleader of the group that is against playing and that's kind of the hold up right now uh, just your your response to that report and maybe its ramifications and what it portends for the future, if anything. Well, uh, um, Michigan obviously carries a lot of weight, uh, and and that's not just in the Big Ten. That's not just in a football sense. That's nationally as you know a, a pretty powerful university, um, and a pretty powerful university has to have a pretty powerful president. And with his medical background, I mean, I think. If, if he's um, if, if he truly is kind of the the leading leading the charge on that, that that could make things tougher than it would have been. Um, but again, if 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 we get to a point where the Big Ten, I mean, at some point, the Big Ten is going to have to have a return to play plan. Um, it probably needs to come soon. Uh, I mean, I was saying that. <laughs> Within a week after the Big Ten announced this decision, and it was met with such um, 
such resistance that the sooner you can get that out, um, you can just move on to, okay, here's what's coming next. But Big Ten hasn't gotten there. I know Big Ten ADs and presidents, chancellors, coaches are all working on it. Um, but it seems like the time is – well, the time was about a week and a half ago to to kind of have that locked up, and they're they're still trying to get there. So, you know, it, it, with the eleven to three vote, uh, if, if you're starting to look at okay, now you've got to flip some votes. Um, it just it, it becomes really really hard when you've got such a heavyweight in Michigan. If they remain opposed, uh, we know Jim Harbaugh wants to play, of course, but we just don't know how widespread that was at the University of Michigan itself, which is, you know, has 50,000 undergrads and expertise in, in so many areas. It's not quite as, you know, I guess, unified uh, as Nebraska has been. But then a, a lot of Big Ten schools probably weren't. Brandon Vogel's with us on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, I want to get into the NCAA Division One Football Oversight Committee. Uh, their head Shane Lyons, who's the athletic director of West Virginia, had an interview on Thursday night where he kind of talked about the uh, the recommendations that they're laying forth, going to send it to the NCA for approval next week. Uh, in there, they talked about uh, early enrollees not being allowed to play in a spring season. They talked about uh, an April 17th stop date, and they also talked about uh, fall ball as a way to kind of replace the spring ball that was lost this past spring. Can you take us through what the oversight committee said and what that means for Nebraska? Yeah, so, um, and, and this might uh, have some, some influence on, on what the Big Ten decides to do. So, if, if I have this correctly from, from what they decided, uh, you basically, your options are to play in the fall. So, if you're Alabama right now and say Alabama plays their full, you know, they're, they're able to get through their 10 games and they go off and, and win the college football playoff in all likelihood because it's Alabama. That's fine. Okay, you did that in the fall. You had your 2020 season. You can have spring football, spring of 2021. Um, if you're playing in the spring, which we know, uh, like FCS football, for example, some of those conferences are playing to play in the, in the spring, um, solely contained in 2021, you can go through what I think is the 12 hours of practice per week now, 12 hours of workouts and practice, which is only five hours actually on the field. Um, do that through the spring. Play your season, uh, or do that through the fall. Play your season in the spring, and no spring football practices then after that, of course. you got to be done by April 17th, which is about when a traditional spring football practice session would end, uh, and then you get ready. The interesting part becomes if you're the Big Ten and, and you're looking at post Thanksgiving or that Thanksgiving weekend, that season is going to have to bleed into January. Um, at which point you're playing in 2021, so you also don't get spring practice. So if Nebraska plays plays an eight or ten game schedule starting towards the end of November, that goes into you know probably January, well certainly January, maybe even February. That would be it for, for the spring semester. There would be no spring football practice for Nebraska under these recommendations. Hmm. hmm, hmm. So that, that is one thing. So all, when you kind of throw it all together, that means that the teams that have pulled the plug or the conferences that have pulled the plug, Big Ten, Pac-12, are sort of volunteering themselves into a disadvantage compared to the rest of college football. Uh, in that you are just forfeiting being able to practice in the spring 15 times like the rest of college football is. Are, are there any other kind of structural, organizational, maybe systemic sort of disadvantages that the Big Ten in Nebraska will experience compared to the other conferences as a result of postponing, delaying, potentially playing in the spring? Um... None that immediately come to mind. I mean, so I guess one of the key questions in terms of a restart timeline for the Big Ten is, you know, this is a conference, and, and you know, and this is a big thing for, for Ohio State, but probably for Penn State too. Um, are they willing to sit, sit the playoff out? Uh, if, if you're going to do that in November, I'd be surprised if the playoff moved. Um, I'd be surprised if the NFL was okay with that. Um if you, you move the playoff to closer to the Super Bowl, um, I can't see the league being being super excited about that. Um, 
So I think I think that's a big one. Uh, they they may be. I mean, the Big Ten could be sitting out the playoff and, and just playing for a conference title, which you know some Big Ten football better than none. But that's tough. Um, and I, I think the, the long term thing is just well, maybe not even long term. Maybe it's just short term. But talking two three years is is the perception that the Big Ten kind of well one didn't handle this uh, in, a, in a perfect manner by any means. But you're going to get that negative recruiting piece of it, and I don't. I don't think that's a huge, huge factor. You can overcome that, and it's, it's all perception anyway. Uh, yeah, when everybody else felt okay to go ahead, they were one of the four that sat out, um, and, and that's that's tough for a conference that was, you know, really getting to a point where, not just in terms of like behind the scenes and boardroom power, but on the field prowess, uh, was drawing closer and closer to the SEC. Brendan, do you think that Nebraska could? You know, take this and use it as an opportunity uh, in recruiting, or I'm not even sure what else. But to be able to say we fought for football as opposed to all these other Big Ten schools, because I know I know the negative press and the negative perception of the Big Ten is going to persist even into the 2021 season and even beyond. Yeah, I I, I think they can, um, and you know, and and they should. Um, they, they've certainly, I mean. Nebraska has been a national story be- because of because of the lawsuit um, and because it's been the one that's been out there. And you know you've got at least probably you know, we can assume two other Big Ten teams who are like, "Good, we're with you. Uh, thank you for doing this. You might have beat us through the punch." You know, Iowa or Ohio State might have might have gotten there too on their own, but Nebraska got there first, and I think that that's able to provide some benefit um, in terms, you know, it's, it's very public how much Nebraska wants to play. So if there is a perception of the league as a whole that, Hey, why'd you get, why are you guys so anxious to sit this one out? Um, I think you can remove Nebraska from that for those that are paying attention and, and being recruited by Nebraska. Brandon Vogel with us on Hale varsity radio. Um, Nebraska just lost a third player of its 2020 recruiting class, all from Florida, guys that just signed in December that uh, a couple of them early enrollees have already decided to enter the transfer portal. There was Jaden Francois, there was um, Henry Gray, and now uh, Nebraska's coveted linebacker recruit. Why can't I think of his damn name? Keyshawn Green. Keyshawn Green, thank you, um, from the Tallahassee area. Um, has entered his name in the transfer portal. So that's dude, that's a big chunk of what Nebraska's recruiting rating was, like its team ranking. Um, you lose three of those guys. Do you, what, could, what do you chalk that up to? Because you can't ignore the fact that all three of them are from Florida and all three of them are deciding to hit the road. Yeah, um, I... <sighs> First and foremost, I think just the the challenges of a pandemic um, and and being that far from home, you get there. Okay, um, it, you know it, it's going to be tough to to be that far, far from home for, for certain guys, no matter what. But you get there, and oh, this is you know it's it's not a normal college semester by any means. Uh, you, you were hoping to be playing today. Um, probably be at the stadium right now getting ready for your first college football game. Instead, there's no game to be played. I, I think that all adds up. And, you know, so the the distance and the national recruiting thing, you know, I know you and I, Mark, look at attrition quite a bit. And, and, and that's one of the kind of costs of having to recruit so far and wide. I, I think you can chalk up some of Nebraska's high attrition rates in that. Um, you know, if you're Auburn or uh, – South Carolina and you get a chunk of your guys from a good chunk of your scholarship guys from two to 300 miles away. Uh, you just don't have to worry about that as much. So uh, it, it's, it's tough. Those were three of, I think the top five or six rated guys in that class. Um, it, it definitely alters that. And, and guys that Nebraska really worked hard for um, in terms of, in terms of Francois, in green, Henry Gray was kind of one of your biggest cheerleaders in that class um, in terms of just how excited he was to, to be there and, and be a part of what was happening at Nebraska. So those are, those are some pretty tough losses. Um, you kind of look at it and say, yeah, uncertain times, I get it. But I think down the road, um, all three of those guys have chances to be pretty good players. 
Um, so it, it might be one that stings for a little bit. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, I know that Coach Root had an interview earlier in the summer uh, where he talked about Keyshawn Green and said he wanted him to be an instant contributor more on the special team side of things and that he may have not been ready uh, to be starting on the defense yet and in getting significant play time there. So do you think that this transfer could speak to the, the talent and, and the depth that Nebraska has built up in the linebacker room? I mean, the linebackers were a bit of a weakness on that defense last year. Uh, but they do return some talent, and they got some guys coming into their second year in the program. So do you think that this transfer could be something about playtime for Keyshawn Green? Uh, I, I would be it, – it's not my first – it's not my go-to uh, explanation, I guess. I think I, I'm – for anyone that leaves at this point, especially uh, you know a first-year freshman, um, a true freshman, I, I'm going to guess, like, you know, hey <laughs> – Stuff's weird. Uh, this isn't what I thought. Uh, and being far from home kind of underscores and, and exacerbates all of that. I, I'm still thinking it's that. But, you know, it, with the – also with the – this will be interesting to watch, too, in recruiting just in general with everyone basically getting a free year now. Um, so you play whatever – however many games you can play this season. Um, you can still come back in fall 2021. You know, for those guys that were in last year's class, they probably some of them definitely signed places based on like, okay, um, this guy's here, he's a senior, so I come in, I'll try and play right away. But if I don't, I've got four games and I can redshirt, and then should be wide open after that. This changes all that math. So, I mean, I think there's there's part of that too. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Uh, we do have college football today. Let's see how many games we got. It looks like six on the docket today, uh, most of which on ESPN or the family of ESPN. Uh, one game on CBS Sports Network. Monday, you got BYU Navy, which I would say is probably the big, the, the first sort of real college football game. Um, it's a high major or close to it. Um, who you got today? I, any of the games today? I don't know, Eastern Kentucky Marshall, Middle Tennessee Army. SMU, Texas State, Houston Baptist, North Texas, Arkansas State, Memphis, Stephen F. Austin, and UTEP. That's who we got today. Any of those games have any appeal to you today? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a small college football junkie anyway. But that Army Middle Tennessee game is probably the best game of the day, in, in my opinion. You've got two really good coaches there. Uh, in, in Munkin and Stocksville, and I, I think that'll be interesting. I'm, I'm also kind of interested to see uh, how option teams fare through through all of this. So Army, Navy, you know, Air Force is only going to play Army and Navy. So I guess that's that's about it. Um, but I think those are always tough outs, and, and we've we've known that for a long time. But I think they might even become a little bit tougher just with you know all of the uncertainty uh, of this. Uh, those those teams have been running the option for a long time, so. That, that one's up there. And that Memphis-Arkansas State game uh, will be interesting. It'll be a look at Memphis, you know, without Jay Nor- Norbell now. And obviously, Arkansas State's traditionally been a pretty pretty strong one. So I think that could be that could be a pretty fun game, too. And you got two schools that are pretty close together. So that's always fun. Uh, although I guess, you know, you can't really have a, a rivalry atmosphere if the stadium is in a, is a 20% capacity. But those are the two I'll probably most pay attention to. Brandon, last thought before we let you go. My fantasy football draft is this weekend. Uh, it, it's a big deal to me. It's about all I'm looking forward to this fall is my fantasy football league. So i got to ask, are, are you yourself a fantasy football player, and do you have any last-minute tips before my draft? <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I apologize. I'm literally the worst person you could ask about this. Um, my dad and I, my dad, brother, and I used to play fantasy football, like adding it up by hand uh, back in the day. Um, but other than that, I have not played. I don't follow the NFL that closely. Um, but if you can get Joe Montana, take Joe Montana. That's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Brandon Vogel, <laughs> um, managing editor for Hale Varsity. Brandon, appreciate your time, man. We'll talk to you next weekend. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, there's Brandon Vogel. Um, Gary Sharp, the Iron Horse, is, is uh, coming up next. And God, Elijah, it's just like... Uh, there is just no certainty we have been able to talk about on this here program for months. You know what I mean? Like, what is something certain 
that we can discuss. Do we just look ahead to 2021? I mean, the, the Husker account did tweet out, hey, year from today, Nebraska, Illinois, and Ireland. You think we can go ahead and bank that one and just start breaking that down? I don't know. I mean, that's that's still uncertain, too. I mean, it, it's yeah. going to... We'll, we'll come in the next few months and, until we get the, the news of when we're playing and that... We, we, it's going to be uncertain probably until the week of whenever our game is scheduled by the Big Ten. Because up until that point, I'm not going to trust them to, to actually have a season. I think we should talk to Gary about the weather. We got Gary coming up. You see that swing we're, we're about to experience? Are you, say, are you saying the weather's more certain than college football at the moment? <laughs> that is a weird statement to make, but yes. <laughs> yes. Never thought I'd hear that the Nebraska weather we can predict with more certainty than the Big Ten. That is seriously where we're at in this world right now 100 degrees on sunday 50 on tuesday let's talk to gary about the weather um <laughs> he joins us next the iron horse gary sharp on hail varsity radio presented by the nebraska lottery early to rise with hail varsity radio the voice of husker nation here's chris schmidt and mark cranach Hail Varsity Radio, Saturday morning edition rolls on. Mark Cranack with Elijah Herbal. Chris Schmidt is out, and he will be back next week, we hope. And we are joined now by Gary Sharp, the Iron Horse. Gary, let's um, let's talk about things that are certain around here. Uh, Elijah yeah. just opined and made a great point before the break that um, Nebraska weather may be more certain – a more certain discussion. You can have a more certain discussion about Nebraska weather than you can about the Big Ten and football right now. Um, and I'm saying I agree. And uh, so your take on Sunday being, well, 101 degrees, according to some reports, and then all the way down to 50 on Tuesday. Gary, comments? Welcome to Nebraska. Uh, Elijah's Don't right. like the weather so, way today. <laughs> so... Um, Think about the, you know, the, this morning it's like nice and crisp. Imagine if Nebraska and Purdue were playing an 11 a.m. game, what that would feel like. Or if they were playing later in the day or early in the evening, you know, you would have the, the Red Cross would be awful busy to remind you of that 97 Akron game or 2000 San Jose State or for some older people, the 85 Nebraska-Florida State game that were really, really warm. Yeah, this is crazy. This is, uh, tomorrow could be a, over 100, and then there might be snow out in the panhandle. What? What are we doing in 2020? When does 2021 get here? We're talking with our, our favorite meteorologist, Gary Sharp, uh, about the <laughs> weather here in Nebraska. Gary, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I do want to move to football because there was the rumor all week. Sorry. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, I, I got I to gotta go away from the weather talk. I, I'm not. All I know is I, I need rain for my lawn. That's all I know. Uh, <laughs> but, Gary, there was the rumors persisting all week about this October 10th start date. And rumors coming Friday, oh, we're going to have a vote on Friday for the Big Ten to to get the Big Ten season back on October 10th. And Friday has come and passed. There's been no vote. It looks as though October 10th is off the table. So so where do you think we're looking in terms of a Big Ten season? Are you still thinking spring? Are you thinking this November start date? Well, I I think we got to focus on the November start date, the Thanksgiving weekend start date. That sounds more realistic. I... It was a rough week again for the Big Ten. Uh, and, um, you've got different factions, whether it be coaches or athletic directors or presidents, that are not all on the same page. And they all want different things. And I understand that we would like football back sooner than later. And I thought for a moment that the October 10th was real and was going to happen. And, and, and it, you, know, you never know. It could happen. They don't have to make uh, public that they are going to vote. Because I think if you are going to re-vote on something that is not before Thanksgiving or 2021. It's a guarantee that you have enough votes and you're going to move forward and set a schedule. I just don't know where the Big Ten is right now. And we kind of say that every week and every day because I don't know what the direction is. And I'm not sure what the knowledge that is being shared. And Any knowledge that's being shared medically seems to get shot down and pulled back and forth uh, between different entities. And it's going to be tough. And I, it's... It was another rough week. I think we were all hopeful, and then we were discouraged, maybe then encouraged, and now we sit here on a day that was going to be the start of the Big Ten season, and we're looking around, and there's a handful of games that are being played this weekend, and then next week on a Saturday there's going to be 21 games played. Uh, So I'm thinking they're focusing now on Thanksgiving. Maybe there'll be 
um, more movements along the medical side that'll put some presidents and chancellors at ease that they can make the decision in a schedule set. But the Big Ten's got to do something. They've got to set a date and they've got to move forward and say, this is what we're going to do. We're not off of it. And it is our goal to get to this point. This is how camp's going to look up to ramp everything up. And we're going to go with it. And that's what we're doing. And you won't hear from us again until the season starts. Look, Gary, in, in this kind of social media world where, you know, the news cycle it changes by the minute, um, things can get sideways for an organization pretty quickly. Uh, but you have to kind of understand that that's the world you're living in. Can, can you yeah. just kind of put into perspective for us, like, how bad the, the Big Ten has handled this compared to any organization or other conferences, period? I mean, just how would you assess their ability to communicate to their constituents with such a momentous and crazy impactful decision? Awful. I think for a major business like the Big Ten conferences, what they did with everybody inside of their bubble and outside of their bubble to explain the decision is just purely, it's dysfunctional, it's discouraging, it's really, uh, it, people use this as an example of what not to do. And you compare it to the Pac-12, which there's, you know, it. Football means less out there compared to the Big Ten. We've seen that this week as the Big Ten has become a prop in the political world. Is They explained to everybody what was the decision and what went into it, and nobody was caught off guard when they made the decision. We are hearing now, Mark, you guys, that some coaches and athletic directors actually heard it like just minutes before it was announced publicly on the Big Ten network. That can't happen. Um, but I think also... You've got some people that are trying to undermine each other. So they're so they are going to the reporters and they are giving them information. I don't know how much longer Kevin Warren can go with keeping things secret. I mean, because it seems like everything is out there about the Big Ten. That's why it's time to find a grown-up in the room that takes the lead and says, this is what we're going to do. We're sticking with it. This is why we're going to do it. And we're moving forward instead of, hey, you might have October 10th, you might have Thanksgiving, you might have 2021, and the Big Ten sits on the sidelines, and they even look at the Pac-12, and the Pac-12 has a game-changing relationship with the daily rapid testing company. The Big Ten is still on the sidelines, and they haven't done anything like that. It's amazing. Gary, what do you make of the damage this is going to do to the Big Ten's reputation? How lasting will that be? And do you think that that will trickle down and hurt Nebraska, too? Well... From Nebraska's standpoint, I mean, they've got, they've got friends uh, locked in arms with people from Ohio State. I think from Nebraska's standpoint, um, you know what? They're going to be okay. There'll probably be some people around the conference that will look differently at Nebraska, but Nebraska wants to play for a multitude of reasons. I think the Big Ten as a brand has taken a hit. I think the football part, the development part, how you sell your program will take even a bigger hit, of course, if – these other conferences start their season and they make it through their season. And when they're making it through the end of their season and they're getting ready for the playoff and you're just beginning your season, that's going to look bad. But I think from the football development side, what's really concerning now is those programs that you compete against on the field, on the field are ramping up contact. They're about to play games. And yet all you can do is just put on less pads and have no contact you're going to take a step back in terms of development. And I think that worries a lot of coaches. But what we're seeing, guys, we also learned this week, and, and, and I, this wasn't the case on August 11th. This wasn't an option. There are probably four or five programs that are not in a position to play in the Big Ten this year, and they are probably going to stand up and say, yeah, we're not fighting for that October 10th. Well, there's ten programs probably in the league that say, we're ready to go. We're fine. Our campus is good. Let's play football. I, 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 one of the things that I, I warned about the lawsuit is, was there ever what, what kind of vote it was or what you were voting on? Because was there ever an opportunity for some schools to move forward and some schools to opt out this year? Gary, kind of a two-part question here, so I, I just want to get your take. You're, you're, you're around the high school football world. Called a game last night, right? Yep. Or, uh, yeah, so I mean, you're, you know, high school football is back. So with that, you talk to coaches, you talk to parents, administrators, athletic directors, all that. Um, just, just real quick, what, what has been, what, what have you heard from them as it relates to coronavirus and sort of the outbreak and then the complications that brings with 
um, getting ready for football. Is it a huge deal for them or, or has have things been going OK? Are there whispers that, oh, my God, there's a bunch of people that have the outbreak or does it seem manageable? I guess is my overall point. I, that's a great word to use, Mark, is manageable. I mean, every coach and every player is walking a tightrope every single day trying to play football. What is encouraging is we have heard nothing, nothing in this country when it comes to the high school uh, football that is being played of any tracking of cases that were transmitted while you were playing football against each other. That's a great sign. You know, last week, 96% of the scheduled games were played. Only five were impacted by COVID-19. Now, last night, Omaha Scott came down to Waverly, and Omaha Scott was very shorthanded because of uh, players that had come in contact last weekend with a party that had uh, COVID-19. And so that affected them. Their long winning streak came to an end. I think there's a couple of other cases uh, around the state last night. But it's a tightrope. And, but, I, but the thing that I'm encouraged about, every coach that I've talked to, is their kids, their staff, they understand what they have to do. They have to be smart. There are no guarantees. There is risk. But just because they get the opportunity to play – and they can continue to get the opportunity to play by doing the right thing. And it, you know, Friday nights now for the last two weeks has felt kind of normal. It's been nice. It's been good football. It's been exciting. Um, I just hope we can keep it that way. But you know what? I don't think, guys, we would have gotten to September 5th maybe a month or, or six weeks ago, and there were a lot of people saying, man, you're never going to make it. You're never going to make it to Labor Day. There's going to be no football. Because remember, when Nebraska, or excuse me, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 shut it down, everybody thought the rest of college football would shut it down. Oh, well, you know what? There's college football this weekend. There's NFL football next week, and there's twelve. There's 21 games next Saturday, and then two weeks later the SEC starts. So I think people are doing the right thing. It's not easy. It's a tightrope. But if you do the right thing and you have the protocols in place, you can go week by week, or in this case, day by day, to get to week by week. You know, and Gary, here's the thing: high schools, obviously, just budget-wise not nearly as sophisticated of protocols and you're dealing with less mature human beings, just Mm -hmm. high school students versus college students. Um, and if they have it in check, (laughs) why can't college have it in check? Right? Like, I don't know. Cause Gary, I know you take the the virus seriously. You know, I know, I don't think anybody is, it's what makes this conversation so weird is because it feels like when you're saying you want to play football, that you were just sort of, ah, oh, the coronavirus is no big deal. I don't think anybody's saying that, right? I think it's just no. more like it's not, in, can, it's not increasing the spread. <laughs> it's yeah. not increasing you, the risk. It might actually be reducing it. Well, I, I think that's what you're starting to hear this week from medical professionals, that they're finding out that contact sports, you don't all of a sudden get the, the virus. You know, uh, again, zero cases of Corona, uh, COVID-19 were transmitted while a football game was being played last week in this country for high schools that played football. Here's what the, the tough thing to wrap your arms around, and we all get frustrated by this. For example, last night I could have driven to Lincoln, gotten off, taken the exit into downtown Lincoln, driven by Memorial Stadium where the University of Nebraska plays football, and I know with their student-athletes they have the financial means and they have the connections to put together a great plan to keep their student-athletes safe with testing and, and monitoring and all of that kind of stuff. I can drive past Memorial Stadium knowing that there will be no football in that stadium right now and drive through Lincoln all the way out to Seacrest Field where there's high school football being played, and I know they're not daily testing in high schools, and they don't have the financial means to do what a place like Nebraska can do. And I scratch my head and I go, how is that possible? That's the same thing. If you're in the state of Indiana, Indiana and Purdue are not playing football. Notre Dame is playing football, and Notre Dame is going to have 25,000 uh, fans in their stadium. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense, and it all circles back to the Big Ten, in my opinion, made an unnecessary decision. Instead of a delay, they went with, well, so we're not comfortable for a multitude of reasons. Let's shut it down. And now, four weeks later, this is not looking good for the Big Ten. And, and, and I could be wrong because we could be in a couple of weeks everything shuts down, but right now it's an unnecessary decision at that time back on August 11th. Well, Gary, the decision's been made though and now the Big Ten's got to move forward. Uh, Pac-12 Commissioner Larry Scott had an interview earlier in the week where he discussed the Pac-12's plan to come back. He also talked about uh, rapid testing uh, and, and their ability to do that. He, he made an interesting point though about 
wanting to collaborate with the Big Ten to return. Hopefully they can line their schedules up and get some sort of a postseason, uh, get some bowl games, maybe even the Rose Bowl. What, what do you make of that? Well, I think when I heard that the Pac-12 and the Big Ten wanted to align, in my head the other day I said, that October 10th date is out the window. Because in California and Washington and even Oregon, it's going to be, you don't know when those teams will be able to come back and actually practice and be able to have games. So the Big Ten is not in that spot where they can move forward. But the Big Ten and the Pac-12, which we already know, kind of have this relationship together because of the Rose Bowl. Um, I, I think that kind of squelches anything about the Big Ten starting earlier than Thanksgiving and maybe not until 2021. Hey, the Pac-12 has handled this a lot better than the Big Ten has. But the Pac-12 is in a position, they kind of know their role. They're the bottom of the Power Five conferences, and you don't get the sense they're as arrogant. Now, they are dysfunctional as well as how they run their conference, but the arrogance of the Big Ten thinking that they would go first and others would follow just blows me away. And then I think it goes down to presidents and chancellors that have power that are hearing all of this scuttlebutt. They're hearing the White House call the commissioner. They're going to stand up and say, no, 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 nothing's changed. I'm not changing. I, you can't show me anything that's changed. I'm not changing my vote. And so you don't get the number of schools that you have to flip to get to nine, and we're right back in the same position that we don't have football on what would have been the opening weekend. Gary, a week from today, uh, according to Lancaster County uh, Court, the Big Ten has to turn over a limited amount of information based on the Nebraska players' lawsuit. They have to turn over the results of their vote, which they've already said is 11 to 3, which contradicts what a couple presidents have said who said there was not a vote. Some presidents have said there was. Some have said there was not. They also have to turn over their bylaws, which they voluntarily submitted but redacted 11 of 13 pages. What, what can we or will we glean from their submission of the vote and their bylaws, if anything? Well, they're hiding something. If you follow your bylaws to put together a vote, why would you be secret about it? Why wouldn't you just come out and say, this is what the bylaws said, this is how we set up the vote, this is what happened. We're not going to tell you who voted for what, but this is what we did. They're not telling you that. So we immediately go, what are you hiding? You don't have any trust with us. Transparency builds trust. We don't trust you. Uh, Good for Nebraska to forge ahead because I think they're rustling some people in the creating discussion, maybe more towards we got to speed it up to get back onto the field with a plan. Um, I think the Big Ten, though, will hem and they will haul. And I think this is probably now into the top of the second, if you're looking at baseball terms, in terms of where this is in the court. But what it has also shown me, first of all, going to get good for Nebraska to forge ahead and kind of you know put some pressure on the Big Ten. But Mike Flood, who is the lawyer for the players, uh, he will be the next governor of Nebraska. Gary, He's going to put this on his resume. And he'll, 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 if he brings back Big Ten football or is part of bringing back Big Ten football, Mike Flood's the next governor of the state of Nebraska. But I, I'm curious to see how this goes. But I, I think the Big Ten is really, really nervous about this being allowed to move forward. Again, it goes back to arrogance. I think they thought, we, we, we responded to you the first time. It's not, and there you go, you got the information, we're moving on. Well, as the judge in Lincoln said, nah, not so fast. Gary, last thought here, we're, we're, uh, we're running out of time, uh, but do you think that this lawsuit could sour Nebraska's relationship with the Big Ten moving forward? Uh, maybe, um, but remember, Nebraska is still a, a big part of the Big Ten in terms of the finances and the, the eyeballs and the brand. I don't know. There's, you know when, we, when we all get through this, guys, we're all going to have a different feeling for each other. We're all we might have to do some making up. I think I think Nebraska will continue to move forward for Big Ten. It might be a little bit choppy, but hey, they got leadership that has been pretty on record on what they want to do, and they haven't wavered from that. And if the Big Ten can't see that Nebraska is pretty transparent, then I don't know what you know. I don't know what the end game is for the Big Ten relationship with Nebraska, but I think it will continue to you know. Nebraska's not leaving the Big Ten. Um, I just think you know when they sit back down on the big boy table. There might be some schools that are like, whoa, you talked out of turn. I don't think Nebraska will change their position in good form. And you know what? There's probably some schools in this conference at the upper-level management that have more respect for Nebraska, that they have followed through, and they have been pretty strong and uh, consistent with their message. 
Gary Sharp with us on uh, Hale Varsity Radio. Gary, uh, really appreciate your time this weekend, sir, and we'll, we'll catch up again uh, mm-hmm. next weekend. Maybe, maybe with some breaking news, some information, because they have to turn over that stuff oh, like literally a week from today. Yeah, I, I hope. I, I wish we were doing this down in the rail yard outside of the offices. And, I know. You know. We could have memories of, the, of the, our favorite opening game of this season, but I mean, there, there was only one 2005 main game. Well, you know what we can do though? We can read the bylaws on the air. Do, will you take now, section thirteen point six? Now that sounds riveting. I'll be back yeah. soon. Okay, we'll get on that. Gary, appreciate Thanks, your guys. time, man. Have a good weekend. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can't wait for that. Uh, that popcorn reading of the bylaws will get done next week. Mix for oh, riveting radio. Riveting well, radio. About, I mean, literally, they they could very well appear. Now, I could see that being like a Friday night dump, right? Because, you know, if you, if you, I mean, you'll notice that presidents do it all the time. Trump before him, Obama, like whenever you want to release stuff that's that you kind of don't want to make a big deal of, you do it Friday night. Big Friday well, dump. If, yeah. If, if the if the deadline is the 12th, which is next Saturday, it seems pretty obvious that they're probably going to dump it Friday night, which gives us kind of the first chance to read it and start to poke holes. Now, here's the interesting part. So if they did violate their own bylaws, does that render their decision invalidated? Right. And then to remedy that, is it as simple as them just saying, okay, well, let's vote now then. And then they vote and then it's over. I mean, right. It just feels like there's, there's going to be something to that because they fought. They did not want to, they redacted their bylaws. They did not want their bylaws to be public. Now they are going to be. They 11 of their 13 pages they did not want public. That's going to that's going to change. And we're probably going to be the first uh, program unless they get way ahead of the game um, to review exactly what that stuff says. We should book a lawyer for next week. <laughs> like seriously, I was just realizing that like we need a we need an attorney. We need to have an attorney next weekend. Well, attorney Vince Powers has been joining us two or three days a week for the last three weeks to cover this. So maybe we can we can all get together and uh, see if he'll call into the show next Saturday. Yeah, we need to. Yeah. And it, it'd be an early Saturday for Vince. I don't know how he keeps this. I don't know what time he awake awakens. Uh, but yeah, sometime in the seven o'clock hour, it'd be good to have. OK, here's the bylaws. Here's the stuff they turned over. What does it all mean? What does it all mean? Or who knows? Maybe the Big Ten will announce a plan midweek and that stuff won't even matter. Maybe the Big Ten will find a way to, to put it off and be more secretive as they have in the past month. It's possible. I, Certainly possible. I, I don't pretend to understand anything legal. I'm not going to lie to you about that one. That's why it'd be good to have an attorney on. But for some reason, I, I'm I'm not putting it past the Big Ten to be able to, to keep their secrets. Hmm. Uh, but my, my my confidence level after the past month and just the Big Ten uh, itself is is low. It's really bad. I mean, Gary just mentioned it because it, look, Pac, the Pac-12 made the same decision. How come they're not getting a bunch of pushback? And how come they're not being criticized? How come the president's and vice president candidate is not coming after them? Right? Like, well, because they're not in battleground states that's part of it but but they made the same decision right no one's giving them crap because uh, to gary's point they actually uh, provided information as to why they made the decision whether you agree or disagree they're fine whatever but at least you know it's just embarrassing you know michigan is having today a protest at the big house michigan parents um, presumably Michigan players. There's talk that Harbaugh himself might even go. One o'clock today outside the big house. What, if anything, will that do, especially if that's happening on the campus of supposedly the ringleader against playing, University of Michigan President Mark Schlissel? So that happens today. Got to organize a protest at Memorial Stadium for Nebraska fans. I mean, I don't. Th- I think you could draw 10,000. Damon, is it is it time for us to go? It feels like we're over on time here. Yeah, Damon says we can wrap it up. Okay, let's wrap it up. 
All right, Elijah, thanks for sitting in. Damon, good job. Thanks, man, for being there. And um, a fun show today. Thanks for tuning. Had a good time. Yeah, it was good. Thanks, thanks for tuning in this weekend to Hail Varsity Radio. We're back again next weekend and uh, talk to you on Monday. Oh, at- no, uh, Monday's Labor Day. I think we don't have the show Monday. I believe it's Tuesday. Oh, that's right. Talk to you Tuesday at 4. All right. Um, Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Over and out.